Chapter 5 of Three Men and a Boat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Winston Tharp Three Men in a Boat, To Say Nothing of the Dog, by Jerome K. Jerome, Chapter 5. Mrs. P. Arouses Us, George the Sluggard, The Weather Forecast Swindle, Our Luggage, Depravity of the Small Boy, The People Gather Around Us, We Drive Off in Great Style and Arrive at Waterloo, Innocence of Southwestern Officials Concerning Such Worldly Things as Trains. We are afloat, afloat in an open boat. It was Mrs. Poppets that woke me up the next morning. She said, Do you know that it's nearly nine o'clock, sir? Nine o' what? I cried, starting up. Nine o'clock, she replied to the keyhole. I thought you was oversleeping yourselves. I woke Harris and told him. He said, I thought you wanted to get up at six. So I did, I answered. Why didn't you wake me? How could I wake you when you didn't wake me, he retorted. Now we shan't get on the water till after twelve. I wonder you take the trouble to get up at all. Mm, I replied, lucky for you that I do. If I hadn't woke you, you'd have lain there for the whole fortnight. We snarled at each other in this strain for the next few minutes, when we were interrupted by a defiant snore from George. It reminded us, for the first time since our being called, of his existence. There he lay, the man who had wanted to know what time he should wake us, on his back with his mouth wide open and his knees stuck up. I don't know why it should be, I am sure, but the sight of another man asleep in bed when I am up maddens me. It seems so shocking to see the precious hours of a man's life, the priceless moments that will never come back to him again, being wasted in mere brutish sleep. There was George, throwing away in hideous sloth the inestimable gift of time, his valuable life, every second of which he would have to account for hereafter, passing away from him unused. He might have been up stuffing himself with eggs and bacon, irritating the dog, or flirting with a slavey, instead of sprawling there, sunk in soul-clogging oblivion. It was a terrible thought. Harris and I appeared to be struck by it at the same instant. We determined to save him, and in this noble resolve our own dispute was forgotten. We flew across and slung the clothes off him, and Harris landed him one with a slipper, and I shouted in his ear, and he awoke. Wassermeyer, he observed, sitting up. Get up, you fat-headed chunk, roared Harris. It's quarter to ten. What? He shrieked, jumping out of bed into the bath. Who the thunder put this thing here? We told him he must have been a fool not to see the bath. We finished dressing, and when it came to the extras, we remembered that we had packed the toothbrushes and the brush and the comb. That toothbrush of mine will be the death of me, I know. And we had to go downstairs and fish them out of the bag. And when we'd done that, George wanted the shaving tackle. We told him that he would have to go without shaving that morning, as we weren't going to unpack that bag again for him, nor for anyone like him. He said, Don't be absurd. How can I go into the city like this? It was certainly rather rough on the city, but what cared we for human suffering? As Harris said in his common, vulgar way, the city would have to lump it. We went downstairs to breakfast. Montmorency had invited two other dogs to come and see him off, and they were whiling away the time by fighting on the doorstep. We calmed them with an umbrella and sat down to chop some cold beef. Harris said, the great thing is to make a good breakfast, and he started with a couple of chops, saying that he would take these while they were hot as the beef could wait. George got hold of the paper and read us out the boating fatalities and the weather forecast, which latter prophesied rain, cold, wet to fine. Whatever more than usually ghastly thing in weather that may be, Occasional local thunderstorms, east wind, with general depression over the Midland counties, London and Channel. Bar falling. I do think of all the silly, irritating Tom foolishness by which we are plagued, this weather forecast fraud is about the most aggravating. It forecasts precisely what happened yesterday or the day before, and precisely the opposite of what is going to happen today. I remember a holiday of mine being completely ruined one late autumn, by our paying attention to the weather report of the local newspaper. Heavy showers with thunderstorms may be expected today, it would say on Monday. And so we would give up our picnic and stop indoors all day, waiting for the rain. 
and people would pass the house going off in wagonettes and coaches as jolly and merry as could be, the sun shining out and not a cloud to be seen. Ah, we said as we stood looking at them through the window, won't they come home soaked? And we chuckled to think how wet they were going to get, and came back and stirred the fire and got our books and arranged our specimens of seaweed and cockle shells. By twelve o'clock, with the sun pouring into the room, the heat became quite oppressive, and we wondered when those heavy showers and occasional thunderstorms were going to begin. Ah, they'll come in the afternoon, you'll find, we said to each other. Oh, won't those people get wet? What a lark! At one o'clock, the landlady would come and ask us if we weren't going out. It seemed such a lovely day. No, no, we replied with a knowing chuckle. Not we. We don't mean to get wet. No, no. And when the afternoon was nearly gone, and still there was no sign of rain, we tried to cheer ourselves up with the idea that it would come down all at once, just as the people had started for home and were out of the reach of any shelter, and that they would thus get more drenched than ever. But not a drop ever fell, and it finished a grand day and a lovely night after it. The next morning we would read that it was going to be a warm, fine to set fair day, much heat. And we would dress ourselves in flimsy things and go out, and half an hour after we had started it would commence to rain hard, and a bitterly cold wind would spring up, and both would keep on steadily for the whole day, and we would come home with colds and rheumatism all over us and go to bed. The weather is a thing that is beyond me altogether. I never can understand it. The barometer is useless. It is as misleading as the newspaper forecast. There was one hanging up in a hotel at Oxford at which I was staying last spring, and when I got there it was pointing to set fair. It was simply pouring with rain outside and had been all day, and I couldn't quite make matters out. I tapped the barometer and it jumped and pointed to very dry. The boots stopped as he was passing and said he expected it meant tomorrow. I fancy that maybe it was thinking of the week before last, but Boots said no, he thought not. I tapped it again the next morning, and it went up still higher, and the rain came down faster than ever. On Wednesday I went and hit it again, and the pointer went round towards set fair, very dry, and much heat, until it was stopped by the peg and couldn't go any further. It tried its best, but the instrument was built so it couldn't prophesy fine weather any harder than it did without breaking itself. It evidently wanted to go on and prognosticate drought and water famine and sunstroke and simoons and such things, but the peg prevented it and it had to be content with pointing to the mere commonplace very dry. Meanwhile, the rain came down in a steady torrent and the lower part of the town was under water owing to the river having overflowed. Boots said it was evident that we were going to have a prolonged spell of grand weather sometime and read out a poem which was printed over the top of the oracle about Long foretold, long last, short notice, soon passed. The fine weather never came that summer. I expect that machine must have been referring to the following spring. Then there are those new style of barometers, the long straight ones. I never can make head or tail of those. There is one side for 10 a.m. yesterday and one side for 10 a.m. today, but you can't always get there as early as 10, you know. It rises or falls for rain and fine with much or less wind, and one end is NLY and the other is ELY. What's ELY got to do with it? And if you tap it, it doesn't tell you anything. And you've got to correct it to sea level and reduce it to Fahrenheit, and even then I don't know the answer. But who wants to be foretold the weather? It's bad enough when it comes without our having the misery of knowing about it beforehand. The prophet we like is the old man who on the particularly gloomy looking morning of some day when we particularly want it to be fine, looks around the horizon with a particularly knowing eye and says, Oh no sir, I think it will clear up all right. It will break all right enough, sir. Ah, oh, he knows, we say, as we wish him good morning and start off wonderful how those old fellows can tell. And we feel an affection for that man, which is not at all lessened by the circumstances of its not clearing up, but continuing to rain steadily all day. Ah, oh, well, we feel he did his best. For the man that prophesizes bad weather, on the contrary, we entertain only bitter and revengeful thoughts. Going to clear up, do you think? We shout cheerily as we pass. Well, no, sir, I'm afraid it's settled down for the day, he replies, shaking his head. Stupid old fool, we mutter, what's he know about it? And if his portent proves correct, 
we come back feeling still more angry against him and with a vague notion that somehow or other he has had something to do with it. It was too bright and sunny on this especial morning for George's blood-curdling readings about bar falling, atmospheric disturbance passing an oblique line over southern Europe, and pressure increasing to very much upset us. And so, finding that he could not make us wretched and was only wasting his time, he sneaked the cigarette that I had carefully rolled up for myself and went. Then Harris and I, having finished up the few things left on the table, carted out our luggage onto the doorstep and waited for a cab. There seemed a good deal of luggage when we put it all together. There was the Gladstone and the small handbag and the two hampers and a large roll of rugs and some four or five overcoats and mackintoshes and a few umbrellas. And then there was a melon by itself in a bag because it was too bulky to go in anywhere and a couple of pounds of grapes in another bag and a Japanese paper umbrella and a frying pan which being too long to pack he had wrapped round with brown paper. It did look a lot and Harris and I began to feel rather ashamed of it. The why we should be I can't see. No cab came by but the street boys did and got interested in the show apparently and stopped. Biggs's boy was the first to come around. Biggs is our greengrocer, and his chief talent lies in securing the services of the most abandoned and unprincipled errand boys that civilization has as yet produced. If anything more than usually villainous in the boy line crops up in our neighborhood, we know that it is Biggs's latest. I was told that at the time of the great Coram Street murder, it was promptly concluded by our street that Biggs's boy, for that period, was at the bottom of it. And had he not been able in reply to the severe cross-examination to which he was subjected by number 19, when he called there for orders the morning after the crime, assisted by number 21, who happened to be on the step at the time, to prove a complete alibi, it would have gone hard with him. I didn't know Biggs's boy at that time, but from what I have seen of him since, I should not have attached much importance to that alibi myself. Biggs's boy, as I have said, came round the corner. He was evidently in a great hurry when he first dawned upon the vision, but on catching sight of Harris and me and Montmorency and the things, he eased up and stared. Harris and I frowned at him. This might have wounded a more sensitive nature, but Biggs's boys are not, as a rule, touchy. He came to a dead stop a yard from our step, and leaning up against the railings and selecting a straw to chew, fixed us with his eye. He evidently meant to see this thing out. In another moment, the grocer's boy passed on the opposite side of the street. Biggs's boy hailed him. Hi, ground floor at 42's a-moving. The grocer's boy came across and took up a position on the other side of the step. Then the young gentleman from the boot shop stopped and joined Biggs's boy, while the empty can superintendent from the blue posts took up an independent position on the curb. They ain't gonna starve, are they? said the gentleman from the boot shop. Ah, you'd want to take a thing or two with you, retorted the Blue Post, if you was a-gonna cross the Atlantic in a small boat. They ain't a-gonna cross the Atlantic, stuck in Briggs's boy. They're a-gonna find Stanley. By this time, quite a small crowd had collected, and people were asking each other what was the matter. One party, the young and giddy portion of the crowd, held that it was a wedding, and pointed out Harris as the bridegroom while the elder and more thoughtful among the populace inclined to the idea that it was a funeral and that I was probably the corpse's brother. At last an empty cab turned up. It is a street where, as a rule, and where they are not wanted, empty cabs pass at the rate of three a minute and hang about and get in your way. And packing ourselves and our belongings into it and shooting out a couple of Montmorency's friends who had evidently sworn never to forsake him, we drove away amid the cheers of the crowd Biggs's boy shying a carrot after us for luck. We got to Waterloo at 11 and asked where the 11.5 started from. Of course nobody knew. Nobody at Waterloo ever does know where a train is going to start from or where a train, when it does start, is going to or anything about it. The porter who took our things thought it would go from number two platform, while another porter with whom he discussed the question had heard a rumor that it would go from number one. The station master, on the other hand, was convinced it would start from the local. To put an end to the matter, we went upstairs and asked the traffic superintendent, and he told us that he had just met a man who said that he had seen it at number three platform. We went to number three platform, but the authorities there said that they rather thought the train was the Southampton Express or else the Windsor Loop, 
But they were sure it wasn't the Kingston train, though why they were sure it wasn't they couldn't say. Then our porter said he thought it must be on the high-level platform, said he thought he knew the train. So we went to the high-level platform and saw the engine driver and asked him if he was going to Kingston. He said he couldn't say for certain, of course, but that he rather thought he was. Anyhow, if he wasn't the 1105 for Kingston, he said he was pretty confident he was the 932 for Virginia Water, or the 10 a.m. Express for the Isle of Wight, or somewhere in that direction, and we should all know when we got there. We slipped half a crown into his hand and begged him to be the 1105 for Kingston. Nobody will ever know on this line, we said, what you are or where you're going. You know the way. You slip off quietly and go to Kingston. Well, I don't know, gents, replied the noble fellow, but I suppose some train's got to go to Kingston, and I'll do it. Give me the half crown. Thus we got to Kingston by the London and Southwestern Railway. We learned afterward that the train we had come by was really the Exeter Mail, and that they had spent hours at Waterloo looking for it, and nobody knew what had become of it. Our boat was waiting for us at Kingston just below the bridge, and to it we wended our way, and round it we stored our luggage, and into it we stepped. Are you all right, sir? said the man. Right it is, we answered, and with Harris at the skulls, and I at the tiller lines, and Montmorency unhappy and deeply suspicious in the prow, out we shot onto the waters, which for a fortnight were to be our home. End of chapter five. Chapter six of Three Men in a Boat by Jerome K. Jerome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vinny Tesla. Three Men in a Boat, To Say Nothing of the Dog, by Jerome K. Jerome. Chapter 6. Kingston. Instructive Remarks on Early English History. Instructive Observations on Carved Oak and Life in General. The Sad Case of Stivings, Jr. Musings on Antiquity. I Forget That I Am Steering. Interesting Result. Hampton Court Maze. Harris as a guide. It was a glorious morning, late spring or early summer as you care to take it, when the dainty sheen of grass and leaf is blushing to a deeper green, and the year seems like a fair young maid, trembling with strange wakening pulses on the brink of womanhood. The quaint back streets of Kingston, where they come down to the water's edge, looked quite picturesque in the flashing sunlight. The glinting river with its drifting barges, the wooded towpath, the trim-kept villas on the other side. Harris, in a red and orange blazer, grunting away at the skulls, the distant glimpses of the gray old palace of the Tudors, all made a sunny picture, so bright but calm, so full of life and yet so peaceful that, early in the day though it was, I felt myself being dreamily lulled off into a musing fit. I mused on Kingston, or Kingston, as it was once called in the days when Saxon kings were crowned there. Great Caesar crossed the river there, and the Roman legions camped upon its sloping uplands. Caesar, like in later years, Elizabeth, seems to have stopped everywhere. Only. He was more respectable than good Queen Bess. He didn't put up at public houses. She was nuts on public houses, was England's virgin queen. There's scarcely a pub of any attractions within ten miles of London that she does not seem to have looked in at, or stopped at, or slept at, some time or another. I wonder now, supposing Harris, say, turned over a new leaf, and became a great and good man, got to be Prime Minister, and died, if they'd put up signs over the public houses that he had patronized. Harris had a glass of bitter in this house. Harris had two of Scotch cold here in the summer of 88. Harris was chucked from here in December 1886. No, there'd be too many of them. It would be the houses he'd never entered that would become famous. Only house in South London that Harris never had a drink in people would flock to it to see what could have been the matter with it. 
How poor, weak-minded King Edwy must have hated Kinnigston. The coronation feast had been too much for him. Maybe boar's head stuffed with sugar plums did not agree with him. It wouldn't with me, I know. And he'd had enough of sack and mead, so he slipped off from the noisy revel to steal a quiet moonlit hour with his beloved Elgiva. Perhaps from the casement, standing hand in hand, they were watching the calm moonlight of the river, while from the distant hills the boisterous revelry floated in broken bursts of faint-heard din and tumult. Then brutal Odo and St. Dunstan force their rude way into the quiet room and hurl coarse insults at the sweet-faced queen and drag poor Edwy back to the loud clamor of the drunken brawl. Years later, to the crash of battle music, Saxon kings and Saxon revelry were buried side by side, and Kingston's greatness passed away for a time to rise once more when Hampton Court became the palace of the Tudors and the Stuarts, and the royal barges strained at their moorings on the river's bank, and bright-cloaked gallants swaggered down the water steps to cry, What fairy ho! Gadzooks! Gramercy! Many of the old homes roundabout speak very plainly of the days when Kingston was a royal borough, and nobles and courtiers lived there near their king, and the long road to the palace gates were gay all day, with clanking steel and prancing palfreys, and rustling silks and velvets and fair faces. The large and spacious houses, with their oriel, latticed windows, their huge fireplaces and their gabled roofs, breathe of the days of hose and doublet, of pearl-embroidered stomachers and complicated oaths. They were upraised in the days when men knew how to build. The hard red bricks have only grown more firmly set with time, and their oak stairs do not creak and grunt when you try and go down them quietly. Speaking of oak staircases, reminds me that there is a magnificent carved oak staircase in one of the houses in Kingston. It is a shop now in the marketplace, but it was evidently once the mansion of some great personage. A friend of mine who lives in Kingston went in there to buy a hat one day and, in a thoughtless moment, put his hand in his pocket and paid for it then and there. The shopman, he knows my friend, was naturally a little staggered at first, but quickly recovering himself and feeling that something ought to be done to encourage this sort of thing, asked our hero if he would like to see some fine old carved oak. My friend said he would, and the shopman thereupon took him through the shop and up the staircase of the house. The balusters were a superb piece of workmanship, and the wall all the way up was oak paneled with carving that would have done credit to a palace. From the stairs, they went into the drawing room, which was a large, bright room, decorated with a somewhat startling, though cheerful, paper of a blue ground. There was nothing, however, remarkable about the apartment, and my friend wondered why he had been brought there. The proprietor went up to the paper and tapped it. It gave forth a wooden sound. Oak, he explained, all carved oak, right up to the ceiling, just the same as you saw on the staircase. But, great Caesar, man, expostulated my friend. You don't mean to say you've covered over carved oak with blue wallpaper? Yes, was the reply. It was expensive work. Had to matchboard it all over first, of course. But the room looks cheerful now. It was awful gloomy before. I can't say I altogether blamed the man, which is doubtless a great relief to his mind. From his point of view, which would be that of the average householder, desiring to take life as lightly as possible, and not that of the old curiosity shop maniac, there is reason on his side. Carved oak is very pleasant to look at, and to have a little of, but it is no doubt somewhat depressing to live in for those whose fancy does not lie that way. It would be like living in a church. No. What was sad in his case was that he, who didn't care for carved oak, should have his drawing room paneled in it, while people who do care for it have to pay enormous prices to get it. It seems to be the rule of this world. 
Every person has what he doesn't want, and other people have what he does want. Married men have wives and don't seem to want them, and young single fellows cry out that they can't get them. Poor people who can hardly keep themselves have eight hearty children. Rich old couples with no one to leave their money to die childless. Then there are the girls with lovers. The girls that have lovers never want them. They say they'd rather be without them and that they bother them. And why don't they go and make love to Miss Smith and Miss Brown, who are played and elderly, and haven't got any lovers? They themselves don't want lovers. They never mean to marry. It does not do to dwell on these things. It makes one so sad. There was a boy at our school. We used to call him Sandford and Merton. His real name was Stivings. He was the most extraordinary lad I have ever come across. I believe he really liked study. He used to get into awful rows for sitting up in bed and reading Greek. And as for French irregular verbs, there was simply no keeping him away from them. He was full of weird and unnatural notions about being a credit to his parents and an honor to the school. He yearned to win prizes and grow up and be a clever man. He had all those sorts of weak-minded ideas. I never knew such a strange creature. Yet harmless, mind you, as the babe unborn. Well, that boy used to get ill about twice a week so that he couldn't go to school. There was never such a boy to get ill as that Sandiford and Burton. If there was any known disease going within ten miles of him, he had it, and had it badly. He would take bronchitis in the dog days, and have hay fever at Christmas. After a six weeks period of drought, he would be stricken down with rheumatic fever, and he would go out in the November fog and come home with the sunstroke. They put him under laughing gas one year, poor lad, and drew out all his teeth, and gave him a false set, because he suffered so terribly with toothache. Then it turned to neuralgia and earache. He was never without a cold, except once for nine weeks when he had the scarlet fever, and he always had chill blades. During the great cholera scare of 1871, our neighborhood was singularly free of it. There was only one reputed case in the whole parish, and that case was young Stivings. He had to stop in bed when he was ill, and eat chicken and custards and hothouse grapes, he would lie there and sob because they wouldn't let him do Latin exercises and took his German grammar away from him. And we other boys, who would have sacrificed ten terms of our school life for the sake of being ill for a day, and had no desire whatever to give our parents any excuse for being stuck up about us, couldn't catch so much as a stiff neck. We fooled about in drafts and it did us good and freshened us up. And we took things to make us sick, and they made us fat and gave us an appetite. Nothing we could think of seemed to make us ill until the holidays began. Then, on the breaking up day, we caught colds and whooping cough and all kinds of disorders, which lasted until the term recommenced, when, in spite of everything we could maneuver to the contrary, we would suddenly get well again and be better than ever. Such is life, and we are but grass that is cut down and put into the oven and baked. To go back to the carved oak question, they must have had very fair notions of the artistic and the beautiful, our great-grandfathers. Why, all our art treasures of the today are only the dug-up commonplaces of three or four hundred years ago. I wonder if there is real intrinsic beauty in the old soup plates, beer mugs, and candle snuffers that we prize so now or if it is only the halo of age glowing around them that gives them their charms in our eyes. The old blue that we hang about our walls as ornaments were the common everyday household utensils of a few centuries ago. And the pink shepherds and the yellow shepherdesses that we hand round now for all our friends to gush over and pretend they understand were the unvalued mantle ornaments that the mother of the 18th century would have given the baby to suck when he cried. Will it be the same in the future? Will the prized treasures of today always be the cheap trifles of the day before? Will rows of our willow-patterned dinner plates 
be ranged above the chimney pieces of the grate in the year 2000 and odd? Will the white cups with gold rims and beautiful gold flower inside, species unknown, that our Sarah Janes now break in sheer lightheartedness of spirit, be carefully mended and stood upon a bracket and dusted only by the lady of the house? That china dog that ornaments the bedroom of my furnished lodgings. It is a white dog, its eyes blue, its nose is a delicate red with spots, its head is painfully erect, its expression is amiability carried to the verge of imbecility. I do not admire it myself. Considered as a work of art, I may say it irritates me. Thoughtless friends jeer at it, and even my landlady herself has no admiration for and excuses its presence by the circumstance that her aunt gave it to her. But in 200 years' time, it is more than probable that the dog will be dug up from somewhere or other, minus its legs and with its tail broken, and will be sold for old china and put in a glass cabinet, and people will pass it round and admire it. They will be struck by the wonderful depth of color on the nose, and speculate as to how beautiful the bit of the tail that is lost no doubt was. We, in this age, do not see the beauty of that dog. We are too familiar with it. It is like the sunset and the stars. We are not awed by their loveliness because they are common in our eyes. So it is with the China dog. In 2288, people will gush over it. The making of such dogs will have become a lost art. Our descendants will wonder at how we did it and say how clever we were. We shall be referred to lovingly as those grand old artists that flourished in the 19th century and produced those china dogs. The sampler that the eldest daughter did at school would be spoken of as tapestry of the Victorian era and be almost priceless. The blue and white mugs of the present day roadside inn will be hunted up all cracked and chipped and sold for their weight in gold and rich people will use them for claret cups and travelers from Japan will buy up all the presents from Ramsgate and souvenirs of Margate that may have escaped destruction and take them back to Jedo as ancient English curios. At this point, Harris threw down the skulls, got up and left his seat, and sat on his back and stuck his legs in the air. Montmorency howled and turned a somersault, and the top happer jumped up and all the things came out. I was somewhat surprised, but did not lose my temper. I said, pleasantly enough, Hello, what's that for? What's that for? Why? Now, on second thought, I will not repeat what Harris said. I may have been to blame, I admit it, but nothing excuses violence of language and coarseness of expression, especially on a man who has been carefully brought up, as I know Harris had been. I was thinking of other things, and forgot, as anyone might easily understand, that I was staring, and the consequence was that we'd got mixed up a good deal with the towpath. It was difficult to say for a moment which was us and which was the Middlesex bank of the river, but we found out after a while and separated ourselves. Harris, however, said that he had done enough for a bit and proposed that I should take a turn. So, as we were in, I got out and took the tow line and ran the boat on past Hampton Court. What a dear old wall that is that runs along the river there. I never pass it without feeling better for the sight of it. Such a mellow, bright, sweet old wall. What a charming picture it would make, with the lichen creeping here and the moss growing there. A shy young vine peeping over the top of this spot to see what is going on upon the busy river, and the sober old ivy clustering a little further down. There are fifty shades and tints and hues in every ten yards of that old wall. If I could only draw, and I knew how to paint, I could make a lovely sketch of that old wall, I'm sure. I've often thought I should like to live at Hampton Court. It looks so peaceful and so quiet, and it is such a dear old place to ramble round in the early morning before many people are about. But there... I don't suppose I should really care for it when it came to actual practice. It would be so ghastly dull and depressing in the evening, 
when your lamp cast uncanny shadows on the paneled walls and the echo of distant feet rang through the cold stone corridors and now drew nearer and now died away and all was death-like silence save the beating of one's own heart. We are creatures of the sun, we men and women. We love light and life. That is why we crowd into the towns and cities, and the country grows more and more deserted every year. In the sunlight, in the daytime, when nature is alive and busy all about us, we like the open hillsides and the deep woods well enough. But in the night, when our Mother Earth has gone to sleep and left us waking, oh, the world seems so lonesome, and we get frightened like children in a silent house. Then we sit and sob and long for the gaslit streets and the sound of human voices and the answering throb of human life. We feel so helpless and so little in the great stillness when the dark trees rustle in the night wind. There are so many ghosts about, and their silent sighs make us feel so sad. Let us gather together in the great cities and light huge bonfires of a million gas jets and shout and sing together and feel brave. Harris asked me if I'd ever been to the maze at Hampton Court. He said he went in once to show somebody else the way. He'd studied it up on a map, and it was so simple it seemed foolish. Hardly worth the twopence charged for admission. Harris said he thought the map must have been got up as a practical joke because it wasn't a bit like the real thing and only misleading. It was a country cousin that Harris took in, he said, we'll just go in here so that you can say you've been, but it's very simple. It's absurd to call it a maze. You keep on taking the first turning to the right. We'll just walk round for 10 minutes and then go and get some lunch. They met some people soon after they had got inside who said they'd been there for three quarters of an hour and had had about enough of it. Harris told them they could follow him if they liked. He was just going in and then should turn around and come out again. They said it was very kind of him fell behind and followed. They picked up various other people who wanted to get it over as they went along until they had absorbed all the persons in the maze, people who'd given up all hopes of ever getting either in or out or of ever seeing their home and friends again, plucked up courage at the sight of Harris and his party and joined the procession, blessing him. Harris said he should judge there must have been 20 people following him in all and one woman with a baby, who'd been in there all morning, insisted on taking his arm for fear of losing him. Harris kept on turning to the right, but it seemed a long way, and his cousin said he supposed it was a very big maze. Oh, one of the largest in Europe, said Harris. Yes, it must be, replied the cousin, because we've walked a good two miles already. Harris began to think it rather strange himself, but he held on until, at last, they passed the half of a penny bun on the ground that Harris's cousin swore he had noticed there seven minutes ago. Harris said, Oh, impossible! The woman with the baby said, Not at all, as she herself had taken it from the child and thrown it down there just before she met Harris. She also added that she wished she'd never met Harris and expressed an opinion that he was an impostor made Harris mad, and he produced his map and explained his theory. The map may be all right enough, said one of the party, if you know whereabouts in it we are now. Harris didn't know, and suggested the best thing to do would be to go back to the entrance and begin again. For the beginning again part, there was not much enthusiasm, but with regards to the advisability of going back to the entrance, there was complete unanimity. And so they turned and trailed after Harris again in the opposite direction. About ten minutes more passed, and then they found themselves in the center. Harris thought at first of pretending that that was what he had been aiming at, but the crowd looked dangerous, and he decided to treat it like an accident. Anyhow, they had got something to start from then. They did know where they were, and the map was once more consulted, and the thing seemed simpler than ever, and off they started for the third time. And three minutes later, they were back at the center again. After that, they simply couldn't get anywhere else. Whatever way they turned brought them back to the middle. It became so regular at length that some of the people stopped there and 
waited for the others to take a walk round and come back to them. Harris drew out his map again after a while, but the sight of it only infuriated the mob, and they told him to go and curl his hair with it. Harris said that he couldn't help feeling that, to a certain extent, he had become unpopular. They all got crazy at last and sang out for the keeper, and the man came and climbed up the ladder outside and shouted out directions to them, but all their heads were, by this time, in such a confused whirl that they were incapable of grasping anything, and so the man told them to stop where they were and he would come to them. They huddled together and waited, and he climbed down and came in. He was a young keeper, as luck would have it, and new to the business, and when he got in, he couldn't find them, and he wandered about trying to get to them, and then he got lost. They caught sight of him every now and then, rushing about the other side of the hedge, and he would see them and rush to get to them, and they would wait there for about five minutes, and then he would reappear again in exactly the same spot, and ask them where they had been. They had to wait till one of the old keepers came back from his dinner before they got out. Harris said he thought it a very fine maze, so far as he was a judge, and we agreed that we would try to get George to go into it on our way back. End of chapter 6. Recording by Vinnie Tesla. Other audiobooks and writing available at vinnytesla.com.